I'm going to turn this down. Ooh. All right, so I'm here with Matt Lee, uh, who is at uh, John Paul Stevens High School uh, in Edison, New Jersey, and he is one of the uh, feature choirs at the ECDA conference in Cincinnati. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, get a little bit of Matt's time to talk about uh, uh, programming and his repertoire. Um, so thank you so much, Matt, for, for joining uh, me this evening. Thanks um, for having me. Yeah, I wanted uh, just to uh, give everybody a sense of kind of uh, your program and uh, the school that you teach at. So do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, your school, how long you've been there, um, what the choir program looks like there? Yeah, sure. So um, I've been at J.P. Stevens High School now for seven years. I am actually an alumnus of the school. So I went right. here more than 10 years ago and had a, it had a, a great impact on me. And so I came back to teach. And uh, so we have about 2,700 kids in our school and 140 involved in choir, give or take. Um, so I have 130 enrolled and another 10 or, you know, or so uh, just come after school. Um, so in and out of those 140, we have the, the Y'all Come uh, Concert Choir, which is all, everyone in choir. Uh, out of that, I addition a group called Acapella Ensemble, which performs a little harder rep, you know, your Moses Hogan, Morton Lauritsen level kind of stuff. Um, and they meet on Monday nights from five to seven. And then I have out of that, the smaller ensemble, which is the one that's performing at ACDA, uh, the chamber ensemble, which is 30 students, sometimes 32, sometimes a little less. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, you know, we try to, we try to shoot for the moon there and, and do some harder music. Um, and then uh, also on the side, we have the treble choir, which is about 40 or 50 treble voices. And then the tenor bass choir, which usually ranges around 20 uh, tenors and basses, which meet also Wednesdays after school for an hour. Wow. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a full, it's a full program. Um, I suddenly, I, um, finally got a an assistant director this year, Congrats. Uh, Regina McElroy. Thank you. Uh, Regina McElroy has been really, really helpful to me, uh, and just, um, helping with class of management, helping with assessment, helping me make, you know, make decisions, um, and kind of being a balancing force in the program. So it, it is a lot to run and the last, uh, few years have been very busy, but we're really excited, um, to have this chance to kind of showcase these students and what they can do at a national level. Awesome. And are all the kids in the high school coming from one feeder school? Do you have like a feeder program or we several have, middle schools that feed into you? Yeah, we have two middle school programs that feed into us. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Um, well, I know we're all dying to know uh, what your program in Cincinnati is looking like. So do you want to tell us? You don't have to uh, spill everything, but just give us a little teaser about oh, what, sure. uh, I mean, what rep you have. <laughs> this will be in the um, the uh, you know program booklet soon enough, so you know just probably no secrets there. Um, but so, so we're starting with Rose Stephanie Powell's "To Sit and Dream," which has a really powerful text by Langston Hughes. As you know, uh, I, I think a lot of a lot of people know. Everyone knows that he was from the Harlem Renaissance, and he was a really gifted writer. I, and I feel like uh, the main message of this song wasn't so much about dreaming, but more about reading, about um, basically elevating yourself um, and le learning more about the world, and then using that kind of as a motivator to to dream about a better world. Um, and then we're doing a piece called Until All of Us Are Free by Mark Burroughs, who's from the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Um, and that's from Emma Lazarus' text, um, mm. which is really exciting, uh, really in-your-face compelling piece. Uh, we're doing a piece by Rena Esmail, Indian-American composer, uh, called Even After All This Time, with text by Hafiz. And then we're doing a piece called The New Colossus by Sandra Choi. Again, uh, text uh, by Emma Lazarus. We're also doing a piece by Melissa Dunphy called United We Dream, which is from her suite written about the immigrant experience in uh, the Dreamers Act, uh, especially in 2018 when that became kind of a jeopardized issue in our country. And uh, really exciting is that we're commissioning uh, my good friend and composer Mark Miller to write a piece for us. Um, the, the working title is still kind of a, a work in progress, but we're very excited to uh, explore this theme of belonging. As you know, the, the, the conference is very much on this theme of acceptance and belonging. Mm. And so I thought a, a lot about minority um, you know, students and minority people in, in the country. And so you might have noticed that everything from this kind of comes from the angle of, of uh, you know, the immigrant experience. Um, and my students are a pretty unique demographic. Uh, most of them are South uh, South Indian, or, or actually South Asian, I should say, and uh, so that's kind of a little bit of the inspiration for that as well. Is just like, how do people with who look different than maybe the majority of Americans find their place in the world? And I think one of those is through music and mm -hmm. and through a message of acceptance and and uh, loving and and belonging. So so that's yeah, that's kind of our set, and uh, it's it's got ups and downs. It's um, 
very pointed in terms of its messaging, but I'm really excited to present that. Yeah, that's man, that's so be such a beautiful uh, message too. I, I did that Sandra Choi a couple uh, years ago, and is that the one with the breathing? Yes. There's like in, in, yeah, internal breathing in it. That's Hell, yeah, that's, that's such a fun yeah. piece. That's awesome. That's so cool. That's so cool. Um, well, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, your kind of Kamal choir, uh, your concert choir, um, and just in terms of your own uh, kind of philosophy and programming. And, you know, I know we all sit down in August and we, you know, have students in front of us. And, and one of the challenges sometimes is that we, uh, you know, either program too hard or we program too easy or, we're, you know, try to find that middle point. And um, I'm just kind of curious on your philosophy on kind of, you know, starting out the year, you know, how do you program for that introduction choir, knowing that that's really going to be your feeder for your acapella group or your um, select ensemble? Um, yeah. You know, how do you choose music? How do you, um, you know, what's your, uh, what's your game plan? That's a really big question. I'm sure that's something that every teacher has uh, on their mind in August, September. Mm. Uh, so yeah, the kids come to me with a very mixed range of abilities. We have a few kids who can play piano at Carnegie Hall. We have a few kids who have never ever stepped into a music room or maybe don't remember anything past third grade recorder. Um, so I get a really big mix of, of skill levels, probably uh, about 40 freshmen per year. And then a, a few kids from the school who decide, you know, their sophomore or junior, hey, I want to try out choir. So, so yeah, big mix range of things. So I, um, you know, I think in the past, I really tried to program things that were challenging. And I was like, oh, you know, because I am a good musician, I should be able to teach them this you know called one ivory piece or this right. thing um but I've, I've slowly discovered throughout the years and especially the last few years that i need to program for the choir that i have uh which can be challenging when you don't know what choir you have right. <laughs> especially yeah. in August, you know? so <laughs> I, I choose a big range of things and of course just like things in my back pocket that i feel like are pretty successful uh, you know two part things partner songs even for satv traditionally satv high school choir um, so, you know, for example, like this year, I, I was hoping to do something more challenging, but I, I, you know, let's go back to our basics and let's try to find things that just work. So we did, we did, uh, the unison piece path to the moon for our fall concert. We're doing Ashra Shah, uh, which is, you know, has its own challenges. Yeah. Uh, we're just doing stuff like that, that lets them sing and, um, you know, really enjoy the message and also just the overall sonic experience. Yeah. Um, for our Halloween concert in fall, I just, I randomly just decided one day listening to the radio. Uh, zombie by the cranberries came up and there is an arrangement out there but i just decided to make a three-part harmony i talked to them i wrote and they became our concert closer so things like that just to, just to get them excited about singing um mm -hmm. and again you know you have to consider um things such as range such as like melodic challenges rhythmic challenges i find that if the kids can get a hold of the rhythm then it pretty much will hold together and if the rhythm is too complicated for them and for their skills at the the time you have whatever time it is uh it will not it would not do great <laughs> unless right, you really right, right. drill in that. So, so my big message there is is to program for the choir you have, um, and and you don't when you don't know the choir you have, just be flexible. You know, so just there's times um, after our first concert where I've just scrapped the rest of the year. I was like, you know what, this year mm -hmm. is not the year for this Moses, Moses Hogan thing. This is not this is not the year for this challenging Stroop piece. I'm just going to go back to the drawing board and pick out things that I feel like could do better. Uh, I'm lucky to have a pretty flexible budget in terms of like having money for music. Sometimes I don't have any money left over because I bought too many things and then I just go back into my library and find something that's that's nice and accessible. And I, I do think there's a there's more value in picking music that is, um, you know, more at their level, but do it well rather than doing something that's way too hard and it, oh, it barely holds together by the concert. Uh, so that's kind of my philosophy in terms of my my beginner group, and uh, I've even found that for my intermediate group, the acapella ensemble, kind of a similar approach. Like I, mm. I want to be careful not to overprogram and pick something that's way too hard because it just kind of builds frustration, you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and and then in terms of rehearsal, you probably you didn't ask me about this, but rehearsal process, yeah. you know, like going into it, I I give them especially after the two years online and everything, I give them way more um, sectional time than I think they need. So even if I think, you know what, that, that we just did everything by sectional, you're like, no, you know what, one more sectional couldn't hurt because you still have those kids who just need a little bit more support. Yeah. And having that extra sectional time really helps reinforce um, their, just their knowledge of notes and rhythms and style. Um, so yeah, just, just kind of like being more on the cautious side for everything mm. and then doing it well rather than overshooting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I've certainly found, you know, from a sectional standpoint, I've, I always struggled you know, during class to put them in sectionals because they just don't have that many piano players. 
And then I realized with Google Classroom and with all these kind of, um, you know, digital resources that we were just kind of inundated with during COVID, yeah. uh, you know, you can put practice tracks on, on Google Classroom and then go next door and then just use use all the Chromebooks. Yeah. So yeah, and then that's a really hot button, to, um, you know, hot button uh, topic as well in our in our choir world. It's like the reality, like there's so many choir teachers out there who are like, mm -hmm. I would never use practice tracks. I'm against it, whatever. It's like, well, not everyone can read music, you know, right. professionally. Not every kid has a piano or second piano lessons. And right. yeah, it, as long as the practice tracks are there, they have a resource and they can use that too, to help the music. And, and just as like you said, you know, sometimes during sectionals, you would just take, you give a kid uh, the tracks and a Bluetooth speaker and say, okay, go, go learn it and run it again if you have trouble. And right. yeah, et cetera. I totally agree with that. I think it's a good Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of uh, uh, kind of the dark times that we were coming out of uh, from remote teaching, are, are there any, yeah, right. Are there any, uh, uh, kind of um, strategies that you use during that um, uh, pedagogically and then also really, really to just keep kids engaged and, um, you know, I don't know what kind of restrictions were at your school, but um, a lot of us are, are kind of going, you know, really having to build almost from scratch uh, yeah. just because so many kids, I mean, and, you know, I think back, I, I had, you know, 50 kids in an auditorium, they were all spread apart, masked to like, I was yeah. like, this isn't fun for me. I can't imagine oh, yeah. what it's like for any of you. So. Yeah, it's very depressing. Um, so, so I mean, there's two, there's three answers for that. Like, one is like what I did. One is what I wish I did. And then the third is, you know, like what I, how to rebuild from that. So, so yeah. what I did do was, you know, I did, I did the whole everyone meet your microphone and stand up and warm up to me. Please turn your cameras on if you can. Mm -hmm. so first thing too is we just go off camera because of connection issues or maybe their right. environments just, you know they're not comfortable, et cetera. Um, and then I would run through things with a practice track and show them the score while I scroll through online and I go, any questions? Of course you would get nothing back. Uh, and then, and then you keep handing the kids for, um, for them to submit their videos, uh, you know, with them in the center of the frame and sing along with the practice track and practice track being on your headphones and then spending hours and hours and hours of putting together virtual concerts. And I was just way too ambitious back then. And I, I think, I think between me and my student teacher, uh, we had produced like, 10 pieces for each concert, which was way too many. This is like, yeah. it was just like not worth it. So what I would have done was go back and just focus more on community and mm -hmm. focus on more on their like individual pursuits. Maybe they're interested in singing a song or maybe we review a concert together or we talk about excellent choral performances, et cetera. I, I think I, I wish I could have done, I wish I would have done that more. Mm -hmm. and I wish I would have just focused on two or three good songs for the entire choir and then done that really polished rather than have 10 like mediocre songs where I'm trying to use flex time and all this right. fancy editing to make it work. It's like, just not worth it. And, and then the third, the third part of that answer would be like, you know, how are we rebuilding? And I, I think, it, you know, we're going to see these ripple effects happen for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and even like with scheduling, my, my middle school feeders are now switching to a semester schedule. So it's really hard to tell what kind of impact that's going to have on our program. Mm -hmm. um, but in the meantime, just like kind of letting kids know that choir is here and that choir is a really fun thing and just inviting kids into the choir room and focusing a lot on, on building that community. Um, you know, so they really, they, they might come for the music, but they stay for the people. That's kind of become my mantra. And right. so just having the, the FaceTime and the one-on-one -on -one contact, reaching out to kids who came one time and didn't come back the next time, trying to keep that individual connection alive and getting kids to recruit other kids. I think that's my biggest, that does, does our biggest recruiters. Um, yeah. Beyond that, uh, you know, recruitment happens uh, in your rehearsal, you know, mm. so like, even if they're first or 20th time in your choir rehearsal, just giving them a positive experience, I think, is the best recruitment, you know, making them want to stay and want to come back, most importantly, for the next year, I think is important. So, you know, creating a sense of belonging, creating a sense of uh, um, authentic learning, and also a, a sense that they can have their own autonomy, that they're good at something. I think all of those things need to happen for the kids to want to buy into the program. So mm -hmm. those have become my focuses and, and um, you know, encouraging those new kids and, and just giving random shout outs, random informations to every single kid who walks in. And just I, sometimes for no reason, I just turn to a kid and just say, hey, I'm glad you're here today. And they're like, mm. oh, thanks. You know, just like little <laughs> moments like that, I think really add up and make a big difference in terms of what kids want to stay and, and you know, what they say to their friends and like, hey, choir is really fun, you should join. Like, you know, that has to happen organically. I can't, no matter how many times I shout at them, like, hey, you should join choir. You should get kids, right. your friends to join choir. Like they're not going to do that unless they themselves believe in it and have a really great time. Yeah, absolutely.
Um, well, now is my lightning round, so I have a few questions. Uh, Matt has not seen these questions. Uh, some of them require, and some of them are just kind of random fun questions. So uh, are you ready? Oh, OK. Let's go for it. <laughs> uh, what is the favorite, your favorite piece that you've programmed this year thus far? Uh, OK, that's a big one. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at my piece. <laughs> favorite Use those resources. So far. Yes, it's better. Definitely, definitely. OK, let's see. Yes, I do love that. I do love that. Um, so yeah, for for my um, yeah, I, I guess I would go for um, until all uh, sorry until all of us are free by Mark Burrows. Mm. Uh, that's again, as I mentioned, that's going to be on our national set. That one has been really impactful, I think, in terms of getting uh, well. The message is first of all really strong. It's until mm. all of us are free, none of us are free, and we learned from uh, Mark the other night that he misquoted it, it was it's supposed to be until we are all free. None of us are free, but mm. it's just a really strong message. It's just so powerful. Um, there's a lot of angsty, crushy, like uh, crunchy chords in there. Uh, the kids get to really sing. And mm. uh, the one of the challenges of that piece is that there were just so many uh, like schwa sounds, you know, yeah. like accented and unaccented schwa sounds. And so uh, everyone we brought it to was like, you try try just making it a little brighter. And so that's been a really cool challenge for my kids. And yeah. um, hearing the result of changing their vowels uh, has been really cool. And uh, in general, it's just a really exciting piece. B minor all the way through, lots of lots of seconds here and there, lots of sevenths. Um, cool. So that's one of my favorite songs. From this nice. Uh, what's a piece that you've programmed recently that you can't wait to do again? Ooh, from like like from the recent years. Yeah, or, you know, a, a piece that your seniors would have sung and you're just kind of waiting for them to graduate so you can do it again. Oh, <laughs> um, I, I guess uh, for my big choir, uh, one of the things that I really love doing is Tres Cantos Nativos, which we did, uh, I yeah, think, yeah. for my seniors or freshmen. Everyone, I think, loves that piece. And I think for choir directors, everyone's like, oh, yeah, that piece. But for my kids, they've never heard anything like it. And for mm. them to make those rainforest sounds and this, and this bird sounds in the beginning has been really, really cool. So just thinking back on what well, my seniors or freshmen, they loved it so much. Um, and sometimes when it rains, I just do that like finger snapping thing. And one of the kids was like, isn't that the song we sang freshman year? Or, <laughs> this year? I'm like, no, not this year, but maybe next year. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. They, cool. They really that one. yeah. Um, what's your favorite uh, New England state? Oh, that's such a hard question. <laughs> and you're going to make some people upset, so you just got to oh, be prepared no. for that. <laughs> so Jersey doesn't count as New England, I guess. Correct. <laughs> uh, does New York count as New England? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, I'm going to go to Massachusetts. Uh, Massachusetts. We just had, <laughs> we just had our uh, conference there not too long ago. Boston yeah. was really fun. I love I loved the clam chowder, and I love just walking around the harbor and love all the history. So sorry, Solid, everyone else. Solid answer for Massachusetts people. Uh, <laughs> who is a conductor or a composer that you would love to bring into work with your choirs that you haven't yet? Oh, that's a big one. Um, uh, I, I guess I would love to bring in, um, let's see, well, well, recently we had we had Amanda Quist come in. I saw that, yeah. Room. yeah, she was awesome. Uh, she just did our All-State Festival too. Um, we, I, I guess I'll say this because I, I don't really count it as, as her working with our choirs, but Deanna Joseph from Georgia State, like mm. she, um, I, I through, through a grant, I uh, had her come just like kind of critique one of our videos, but I don't really consider it as, as them working with her necessarily. Right. Yeah. Um, so I would love to have her in like, like either on Zoom or, or live and just kind of give her some of her strategies to our choir. Um, that's someone that I, would, I really admire and would love to get her in. But, so. Awesome. Yeah. Um, do you have any bucket list vacation travel destinations that you haven't been to yet? <laughs> um, I would love to go to Italy or Germany. Mm. You haven't been to Italy or Germany? No, no, I've been to ah. France. Yeah, I've also been to the Baltic. I've been to Lithuania, Estonia, and, and Latvia, which is, of course, everyone's first um, choice. But, right. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's really great. That was that was for singing tour. Um, but I would love to go to Italy and just kind of see all the ruins. And um, I, I just, after going to France, I just realized, like, in America, there's only so much history you can go back to, right? It's like right. 1600s, and everything else is kind of gone. Um, but uh, yeah, I would love to see, uh, I would love to see the ruins in, in like Rome, for example. That would be really cool. Cool. Um, what is on your uh, bucket list choral conducting? Like, if you could conduct any piece, any choir, any piece. <laughs> um, so, like, I think Chichester Psalms is on there. Mm. I think that would be really interesting. Um, Mahler, too, would be incredible. Mm. Um, 
and I, you know, I have I have a whole list of bucket list things, but, but those just kind of off the top of my head. I think yeah, really, yeah. <laughs> and then finally, um, are you a dough based miner or law based miner? Law based miner, all the way. Oh. Okay. <laughs> well, if you didn't piss off the other New England people, then oh, no. that might have done it. <laughs> polarizing into you. You didn't warn me. <laughs> Uh, well, thanks so much, Matt. I appreciate it. And uh, we can't wait to see you in Cincinnati.